Hey everybody, it's Nick from Android Headlines. So, how well have the last two months treated Samsung's Galaxy S7 Edge? In this video, you're going to find out. So you've likely run into this situation before, or at least I know I have on many, many occasions. You get a new phone and are blown away by how good it is. Look at how amazing this build quality is, this sleek design, this new user interface, and all these awesome features are things that you've likely said, only to find out a month or two later that the phone pretty much ends up sucking. It's a terribly unfortunate situation, especially when the phone in question costs well over seven or eight hundred dollars. What can I say about the Galaxy S7 Edge in this particular scenario? Well, it's not only held up after two months of usage, but I actually like it more now than I did when I first reviewed it so many weeks ago. This is the first Samsung phone I've used in a long time where I've felt this way, and why I think 2016 is a really big turnaround year for the company. Let's start with the build. This is easily the sexiest phone on the market, with a design and build that's second to none anywhere. I don't normally like to use that term just because it's so overused in this market, but it really does apply to this phone. The curved glass is still stunning to this day, even with it looking nearly identical to last year's Galaxy S6 Edge 2. Every time I pick the phone up, I find myself pausing, even ever so slightly, at just how freaking good this screen looks. It's not just the stunning curves that do it either, which create an illusion of bringing the screen above the glass. It's the unbelievably good Super AMOLED panel below it. This thing lives up to the Samsung AMOLED name in every single way, both the good and the bad. But the negatives are so few and far between that it absolutely smashes any other display on the market. Everything from the gorgeous colors to the infinite blacks, the refresh rate, and even the stellar viewing angles come into play here, not to mention the white balance and the color accuracy too. The edge features are honestly not something I ever use though, and although I've tried to force myself to try them time and time again, I just never come back when I'm normally using the phone. Sure, there's some cute stuff here like easy to find news highlights, sports scores, and stock tickers, but most of the stuff can be found in Google now or just in the notification shade, and I found myself never really caring that they were there. People Edge is likely the best feature here as it provides ultra quick access to contacts no matter where you're at on the phone, but pressing the overview button and switching to your last chat app or the dialer is likely just an extra finger press away at the most, so it's really not that big of a deal. I really found myself just not caring about any of these unique edge features and simply appreciating the beauty that the curved glass brings to everyday experiences on the phone, and honestly that was just fine with me. I also constantly find myself admiring just how good this thing feels in the hand. It's smooth everywhere, features a build that feels solid as a rock, and really just feels like the perfect weight for the materials used. It's crazy thin and really doesn't have a camera hump, which is a nice change from the market trends in the last year or so. But those curved edges aren't all rosy though, and are something that's still taking me some getting used to. First off, it's nearly impossible to one hand this phone. That's not to say Samsung hasn't taken strides to let you resize the screen or whatever. We've seen that for generations, and as a first generation Galaxy Note user, and one that's had plenty of huge Samsung phones over the years, I'm very used to holding large phones a different way to one hand them. 5.7 inch screens are definitely my usual preference, even with one handed use, but the curve here makes it completely impossible to hold the device in my usual palm on the corner way without constantly touching elements on the screen. I also found that the phone is sort of awkward to hold with two hands as well, and while I made considerably less mistakes than with one hand, I still made far more erroneous clicks than with any other phone I've ever owned or even just used for a long period of time. I also found that the digitizer might just be a little too sensitive at times, as when I scroll through lists of things, especially slowly, I almost always end up clicking something on accident. Part of this could be the palm rejection for the edge kicking in and not working quite right, but whatever the case, it gets annoying when it does happen. It's also very difficult to pick up from a flat surface, so if you're resting on the table and try to grab it, especially with the screen on, expect it to slip out of your hand or accidentally press something on the screen. Part of this problem also comes from the fact that the whole phone is basically glass, with the exception of a small metal trim around all the edges of the phone. Even this trim is slippery though, and it doesn't feel the same as the more powdery finishes of the HTC 10 or the Nexus 6P, which are far easier to hold phones made completely of metal on the back instead. There's also the downside of it being easier to break, and I unfortunately pulled the phone out of my pocket one day to find the right edge right next to the power button was cracked. I still can't figure out how this happened to this day, especially since I always place the screen against my leg, but considering I never use cases on my phones and I'm normally overly gentle with my devices, it's incredibly disappointing to say the least. The always on screen functionality just plain rocks. This is one of the most used features I've ever had in any phone, much less Samsung's history of crazy feature rich devices, 
and it's incredibly handy to say the least. Having an AMOLED panel means Samsung can keep the brightness relatively high without sacrificing battery life like the LG G5 and its LCD display does. Plus, Samsung's design for the always-on display is better here. There's tons of options and designs to use, customizable features, and even some themes will completely change the look and feel of the always-on display. It's a phenomenal feature that I hope we see elsewhere, and it's way better than the adaptive display that we've seen on Motorola and Nexus phones for years now. Audio quality coming from that 3.5mm headset jack is nothing short of superb. 24-bit high-res audio is a thing of brilliance, and even listening to it on a regular sound system reveals extra details in the sound you might not notice from other phones. Samsung even has some incredible upscaling here and a great built-in equalizer that most OEMs don't bother with. Just don't expect anything good out of that external speaker you'll find on the bottom. Waterproofing means that it's inherently not going to sound quite as good, and Samsung has never really been known for their great external speakers anyway. It's loud, but that's really about it, and of course that placement on the bottom of the phone means you're going to have to cup it to hear it best. Speaking of waterproofing, I found that being a waterproof phone, but also one that's completely made of glass, is sort of a funny combination. Yes, there have been plenty of times that I'm really glad it's waterproof, and I absolutely wouldn't change that feature for anything. I just wish it were still made of more durable stuff and still be waterproof. Drop or crack this one even a little bit, and its waterproofing abilities are long gone, and that's really quite a shame like the device I have in question. Moving on to the software front, TouchWiz is absolutely the best it has ever been, bar none. I've long been a TouchWiz hater because the skin has just honestly been so intolerable on so many levels, it's difficult to count them all. Last year, we finally saw a massive change at Samsung in this department, and this year continues that departure from the poor design decisions and bloated software of the past to the new leaner, cleaner Samsung. In addition to this, the usual Samsung stutter or lag is virtually completely gone, Although I did find that the phone would chug after any kind of heavy use, even after just long web browsing on pages that are full of ads or other heavy visual makeup. This lag seems to be completely caused by the thermal throttling of the phone, something that seems a bit odd given Samsung's cooling built into the device. Even more puzzling is that ours is a Snapdragon 820 powered model, a processor that's not known to get overly hot in any other phone it's used in. Likely there's some tweaking that needs to be done here, but it's certainly more than just annoying as it becomes uncomfortable to hold on the metal sides when it gets hot. And given how difficult the edge screen plus the glass back make it to hold, you may just want to stick a case or skin on this one and not worry about it any longer. Which really is a shame given the fact that you're going to have to cover up that beautiful body. While performance can be a bit wonky at times, most of the time the phone is a champ. It blazes through any high-end mobile game and masters multitasking with its 4 gigs of RAM under the hood, plus the fact that Samsung seems to have fixed that nasty memory bug from last year's Galaxy S6. One of my favorite incredibly fast features is launching the camera from anywhere by double tapping the home button. This isn't new to the S7 Edge, but it's amazing just how blazingly fast the camera appears once pressing the button twice. Just beware that the home button seems to scratch stupidly easily, and I found mine scuffed after just a few days of use. Regardless of this though, this is the fastest camera I think I've used on any phone ever. From screen off to taking a picture of something takes less than 3 seconds. That includes the time it takes to double press the home button and click the software shutter button on the camera. It's crazy fast and that new focusing method only makes things better. Much like launching the camera, the autofocus on the Galaxy S7 Edge is absolutely the fastest I've ever seen on any phone ever. It's difficult to even realize it has refocused unless you're really paying attention and any kind of movement on the screen will make it refocus in a matter of milliseconds. And it gets it right almost every single time too, which is even more impressive. That new sensor has bigger pixels, and 100% of those pixels are actually used for focusing, and that really does wonders for photography accuracy. And I found it to be unbelievably more accurate than any other phone I've used too, laser autofocus or not. This leads me to my only real complaint about Samsung's camera software still, that processing. This time around, it's only during the day that the processing irks me, but I still wonder why, Samsung, why? Seriously, there's no reason to be processing things this heavily. There's no noise to eliminate that's worth looking at during the day, in broad sunlight, on bright objects. Just stop, please. Take a look at this picture, for instance. The balance is great, the colors are phenomenal, shadow detail is unmatched, and even the highlights have the right color and detail. It's amazing how good Samsung has gotten with almost every element of processing in these images, and it does all this absolutely instantaneously, HDR or not. However, once we zoom in, this picture completely falls apart. Why does the grass look like a Bob Ross painting? Seriously, Samsung, I thought we were past these days of overly heavy denoise filters that make photos look like a watercolor brush went over them. What's more puzzling is that this effect is significantly diminished as we move into lower light, and the low-light capabilities of the S7 Edge are essentially unmatched in the industry. If you've seen our camera comparison, you'll know that the Nexus 6P still takes the balance award in lower light scenarios, but more times than not, the Galaxy S7 Edge took the overall award, including showing more details in areas and giving sharper, more color-accurate photos. At this point, the cream of the crop phones are essentially neck and neck in the camera department, and you'll really not be losing if you have either. 
but for the most part, this one seems to produce the best photos I've ever seen, so long as you're not in broad daylight, ironically enough. Is the Galaxy S7 Edge still worth its $750 price tag? Absolutely, positively. It's a gorgeous phone with a lower price than previous generations, and it does everything much better than those generations did too. I only have a few negative points with the phone, but much of it is just getting used to a different design and trying to get around some nagging issues that Samsung still hasn't seemed to be able to get away from just yet. Two months later and it's still going strong, which isn't something many phones on the market can claim. We hope you enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe if you did. Check out all the rest of our content on YouTube and at the site, as well as Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, wherever you are, we are. Thanks for watching. Until next time.